we've got broken homes and we've got social instability rather than cohesion. So everything that sex is supposed to be aimed at naturally, we've taken it in the opposite direction and you can't carry on like that. It will eventually get scuppered on the rocks of reality, just like the socialist revolution was. It doesn't fit human nature. Aquinas just puts this in one sentence. He says, human nature rebels against the promiscuous union of the sexes. Hello, and welcome to the Renaissance of Men podcast. My name is Will Spencer. My guest this week is a husband, father of seven, and educator. From Nolan Knows, Will Noland. You might have seen his videos here on YouTube, his articles on Substack, or his scorching tweets where he takes down degeneracy, promiscuity, the manosphere, and much more. What you might not know is that he was an educator at the prestigious UK boarding school, Eton, that has produced 20 UK prime ministers. But he was sacked, or fired, for producing a video called The Patriarchy Paradox, which undermines many of the core arguments of feminism. That didn't stop him, though. In fact, it helped him reach a worldwide audience, including me, that was interested to hear more of what he had to say. It turns out they messed with the wrong guy. In our conversation, we discussed his background at Eton and the story of how he was fired, the loss of fathers and the rise of gangs, promiscuity and weaponized chastity, a phrase which I love, taking apart Nietzsche, the benefits of barbell training, and finally, the idolatry of the body that plagues many men today. If you enjoy the Renaissance of Men podcast, thank you. Please like this video and subscribe, and don't forget to share it with your friends. Also, leave a comment letting us know what you thought about the interview. And please welcome this week's guest on the Renaissance of Men podcast, from Nolan Knows, Will Noland. Will, thanks so much for joining me on the podcast. Thanks for having me on, Will. So um, I've been following your stuff for a while, and I've really appreciated uh, the direct and unvarnished way, as you said, though, that you that you share things, and it's really made it's really made an impression. So I've been looking forward to this conversation. I know a couple of my listeners have been as well. Excellent. Happy to be here. So I think I'd like to start with um, your your patriarchy paradox video, um, and and where that came from and and what the background was of of what you were doing when you created it i know that you were a teacher at eaton and maybe some of my listeners don't know what eaton is and so maybe we can start there with contextualizing you know what where that video came from and, and how you ended up in this kind of content creation space that you find yourself in today yeah good questions so eaton is the most preeminent uh all boys school in the uk one of the only ones left actually and certainly one of the oldest and it's produced around 20 prime ministers so if oh, we're wow. thinking about what masculine education has looked like traditionally sending men into the armed forces into government into big business banking whatever it might be eaton's really been the hub of it in the uk mm -hmm. so i taught there for nine years and watched a few changes take place over the time I was there. Sure. And these are the kind of changes that we see happening elsewhere in elite educational institutions all over the West. I mean, you can barely look at the news on any given day without seeing some kind of story of woke outrages, whether it's Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Yale, wherever. Mm -hmm. So the way it works is you get hold of these institutions at the top, and then you implement your changes and things trickle down into the schools beneath and eventually you get educational takeover. Yeah. So why is this relevant to Eton then? Well, I felt watching the lessons and the steer we were being given that there was a very definite agenda to push boys towards a particular view regarding masculinity which is strange because you'd expect an all boys school would support the idea of sex differences, right? Because mm -hmm. otherwise, why are you excluding girls? It seems kind of contradictory to attack the idea that there are essential differences between boys and girls. You have a single sex school yet. This is what was happening. And whenever you see that phrase, toxic masculinity, you know, you have to look carefully to see what's going on there. Unpack yeah. it a bit. The American Psychological Association came out saying that stoicism 
aggression, dominance, competitiveness. These are all apparently traits that are toxic now. And that's weird because over the course of human history, these have been many of the things that women have actually prized in men because they're useful in men fulfilling the roles of protectors and providers for families and indeed communities at large. So when it came that I was offered the opportunity to present a lecture on Eaton's premier debate course for the students who are almost at the end of their time there, they've only oh, got wow. one year left, they're about 17, and we're getting them ready for university and critical debate and to explore ideas with the gloves off. That's mm -hmm. the whole aim of the course. I thought, great, I would love to do this and give them a no holds barred, full blooded presentation of the traditional masculine virtues, their importance in war, for example, why women have valued them, and just to really give them an oops upside the head <laughs> and a different perspective from what they're used to. I'm going to argue the canonical position of evolutionary anthropology, which is that patriarchy isn't a social construct. It's in fact based in female biology. Mm -hmm. And it's basically women choosing the men who compete against other men best to serve women's interests. Now, that's a big shock to people who've only ever heard that patriarchy is oppression. Yeah. What? Patriarchy is based on what women want? <laughs> this is an outrage. Yeah, serve and women. Yet, yeah. yeah, that's what the, the hard sciences say about it. So that was the aim of the course. Students were encouraged to disagree. And that's the case for any lecture they get given, except mine never got shown because mm. another member of staff saw the pre-recorded lecture before the students ever did and said, this is too offensive. I feel oh. unsafe. We can't debate these ideas. And then long story short, they told me, we're not showing this. You also have to delete it off your private YouTube channel even though you've got permission from us to have that YouTube channel, even though you've got the disclaimer on it that we told you to put on the channel, we still cannot have students watching this, even in their free time. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I said, look, tell me the bit in it that you don't like. We can edit this. Let's have a conversation about it. Tell me what you're objecting to. Surely it can't just be the entire thing. Mm -hmm. And I want to uphold the aims Surely. of the college. Yeah. Which is independent, broad-based, critical thought and debate. That's what the lecture is all about. Can't we do this anymore? There's also the fact that in the UK, the Equality Act specifically excludes curriculum content and delivery. So this should mean that teachers can teach whatever ideas they want in mm. whatever way they want without someone being able to claim harassment. So it's a really interesting legal case as well. And my case hasn't been heard yet because of COVID. The courts are all busy, but it's coming up later next year. So it's a big thing about free speech and education. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was front page news here in the UK. You can't teach masculinity at the premier masculine school in the country anymore. What's going on? A lot of parents were interested, a lot of boys as well. And I think it was a, a real hot button topic, which is why I chose it for debate in the first place. Now, so were you surprised by the blowback you got or did you kind of see it coming? Like, what was your, what was your mindset as you're putting this together? Like, oh, this is going to, maybe you thought it was going to ruffle some feathers or were you just like, wow, I had no idea that I'd stepped on such a landmine. I knew that because of the steer we were being given on these topics, that any pushback wasn't going to be appreciated. I thought it might be tolerated a bit better than in fact it was. Mm -hmm. But as is so often the case with the current climate, when you cross these invisible tripwires in discussion, then it, the reaction can get quite severe. Yeah. Despite all the talk about diversity of viewpoint, yeah. actually, it's quite a hard line. And mm -hmm. you even see the group sprint, uh, splintering among themselves when they refuse to tolerate each other too. I know. It's so, very funny. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's frustrating, especially as I had so many supportive comments from um, mothers of students, grandmothers, women members of the public as well, saying that they thought the talk was great. It's just amazing how polarizing um, the truth can be.
Mm. Yeah, I mean, my experience of, of sharing content like that with women is that they're very appreciative of it because they found that modernity doesn't actually serve them, um, that it creates. I think I, I asked you a question on um, on your live stream yesterday. You know, what's the best what's the best case for patriarchy and for Christ to a woman who's secular but is religion curious? And you had said uh, women's stress levels, that when women are within a patriarchal structure, that when women are married and raising children, their stress levels are much lower than when they're in the workforce and fending for themselves. And I think a lot of women intuitively understand that. But that word patriarchy is so charged with negative energy and fear and oppression and dogma that the mere suggestion of it creates that reaction. That's true. Very profound point, actually. And what's important to to note is that at no point in human history has there ever been a matriarchy right yeah so humans are patriarchal and to say that we somehow need to smash the patriarchy because it's unnatural it amounts to saying that we need to smash human nature mm -hmm. and i think it's connected to other ways in which there's a craving to do that now like smashing the idea of biological sex yeah. altogether if a man decides he wants to be a woman well we can just tear down what his given reality is having been born male and make him anew so it's fundamentally connected to those revolutionary ideas which you get at the heart of marxism for example mm -hmm. which is that the family itself is somehow oppressive marriage and the family are at the heart of patriarchy yeah. and to destroy patriarchy we have to destroy marriage so that's what i see it really as being about patriarchy literally means rule by fathers that's the etymology of the word and the irony is that the choice is just between patriarchy or patriarchy you get to choose what kind you get but you don't get to choose to escape it so yeah. what we get instead and I would argue that Jeff Dench and George Gilder, writing a couple of decades ago, were correct in their assessment. The destruction of the black family in particular mm -hmm. in the ghetto and inner cities and the displacement of the provider male by the welfare state was the modern crisis yeah. of man in a nutshell. It hit them first, it hit them harder, but it's now bleeding over into white groups as well mm -hmm. and instead of the single male breadwinner for the family and the nuclear family we get basically a harem of single mothers who all belong to the welfare state and this leaves men without meaning without any real purpose and without the civilizing impact that women in the family have and where do they go instead to the gang yeah yep yeah. Yes, and, and I definitely want to get. I want to jump off of that that gang idea in 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 just a second. Um, well, actually, let's just let's just do it now. You know, there's there's a book that um, there's a book that you and I have both read, Jack Donovan's The Way of Men, where he talks about the way of men is the way of the gang. And so, um, one of the things that's been so interesting for me is that I have I have a long history of going into and through the the manosphere and having met a lot of the people and gotten to know them and spend and spend time with them. And, and to have read all the books and to have realized that there's kind of a hole at the center of the manosphere of philosophy that looks exactly in the shape of what we're talking about right now. And that hole is fathers. That hole, that hole is fathers because the manosphere comes from the pickup era. The pickup era, that's where all the original teachings came from, like Rolo Tomasi. And it's all about fornication. And so now you have this men's movement, this phase of it anyway, that is, tr that is wondering What's the next step? Well, the next step is the thing that you guys can't do. And so let's talk about this way of the gang that's informing this phase of the men's movement that I think maybe have served men up to a point, but I don't know it's going to get men where they need to go. So why put forward the gang rather than the family as yeah. the fundamental social group? Historically, it's not. The family is the basis of the nation and ultimately the state as well. So we have no record of any society before some kind of rudimentary state. And this is why you start with fathers of families, basically forming the early tribal councils, becoming yeah. the elders. 
And then out of that, we get extended families. Out of that, we get villages, we get cities and then nations, right up to the king himself, who's called sire, because that's mm -hmm. metaphorically, he's like the extended father of the whole extended family of the nation. So we don't get to agree society just by mere contract in the way that Hobbes or Rousseau, right. for example, thought. Yeah. It's not sovereign individuals who get together and just say, you know what, life's tough. It'll be better if we just decide to hand over our power to this arbitrary state of our own making. Mm. Instead, mm -hmm. no, we are born as dependent individuals into the natural society of the family. This is why Aristotle said that the, the family is prior to the state. Men and women form the fundamental social bond, mm -hmm. or as the Catholic Catechism puts it, the family is the original social cell. Everything grows from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once you understand this, you see that men and women are complementary, different, but they work together in harmony for the benefit of the child. And we get division of labor, not just within the family, but within society at large as well. Yep. So men and women have to work together in a kind of symbiosis for social stability, for the benefit of children, and also for the common good of the whole community. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sex is about this. It's not mainly a desire just for contact with someone else's genitals in a kind of animal way. Yeah. Uh, a man and a woman are fundamentally incomplete in themselves. Sex is a desire for unity and completion with the opposite sex. And then you get the supreme form of that kind of completion in the, the child, which yeah. combines part of the man, part of the woman in a new being they've created together. And each sees himself, herself, plus the other in that new being as the ultimate kind of unity. So human beings are made for the family and then everything grows from that. The gang, though, is ultimately anti-patriarchy in that it is anti-fatherhood and we're left with fragmentation because there's no way in which a a group of men can achieve the same kind of um, cohesion and community stability that men enmeshed in families can this is quite a mm. radical point for people who think that being a man is all about doing what other men want you to do that it's about being a a tough warrior for example or they might look at motorcycle gangs and think yeah those guys have decided what a real man is they know it's about being able to beat people up it's about being fearless for example it's about honor it's about courage and yeah those things really are masculine but why are they it's because women decide that they are because those qualities are what they want in fathers as protectors of children, as protectors mm -hmm. of women in war. Women decide what makes a man a man and select what kind of men they want to procreate with. Yeah. So the whole, the core of the manosphere is ultimately not just fatherhood, it's women. It's seeing women <laughs> as just disposable objects for sexual pleasure in the way that this is going to be controversial for some people, but in the way that homosexuals see each other in just pick up and cruising culture, hmm. that's how the manosphere encourages men to regard women. And I would argue that they are feminists. The manosphere are uh, feminists, ironically, yeah. in the sense that what is it exactly about the sexual revolution that they aren't assenting to and furthering? You've got sex outside marriage, and you've got contraception as the two fundamental things at the core of the sexual revolution. Yeah. The pill, and then free love. Now, the yeah, except both sentiment of those. Too. Yeah, that's yeah. it. And then you're disconnecting manhood from fatherhood and family yep. if you accept those. Yep. So don't be surprised if you end up with essentially the mirror image 
of feminism, which is bitterness towards the opposite sex, blaming your problems on them, and then struggling to connect what your masculine identity is to fatherhood in the same way that feminists end up defining themselves in opposition to motherhood. What's the most offensive thing you can say to a feminist? Being a stay-at-home mom is valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting ideas that are wrapped up in here. One of the things, so I, I lived in San Francisco for many years and I bought into all of this, all of this ideologies, all these ideologies that we're talking about, you know, uh, including the, the free love ideology, the sort of the new age ideologies as well. And promiscuity is part, part of that. So I, I, when I came in through the manosphere and I, and I watched everything going on there. And as I've had, uh, I was baptized Christian two years ago. One of I mean, the best thing to ever happen to me. So I've been unpacking my life story, understanding the various things that I've experienced and understanding what was wrong about them sort of firsthand taking apart my own, my own history. And, and I think I realized the other day that, you know, during the 1960s, there were, there were these three ideas that were rolled in together, like free love, feminism and this new age anti-christian kind of sentiment is when all of this kind of exploded together and these things have to be kind of parsed apart and you look at the new age anti-christian kind of sentiment and you see that showing up not necessarily in crystals and flowers and, and all that kind of thing there is that element to it that's in secular society but you also have this spirit of defying defying the father defying god the father that's manifesting in all these other ways of, of men today being like, I'll be anything but not Christian, right? And, and it's not a long step from there to say, and, and, and I'm going to be promiscuous and, you know, uh, contraception, and I'm going to be mad at, at women for feminism. And then you get everything flipped around and inverted, like we're talking about right here. And, and these, these, these three threads tie together in this way to make a pretty strong rope. Once you start sawing off one of these threads and you really acknowledge it as, as, as you have uh, on Twitter, you know, that, that uh, if you're into uh, contraception, like contraception is the core of promiscuity that really makes the whole thing go. Once you saw that off, the rope starts getting very, very frayed. Yeah, I think you're right. And it was a very smart move on the part of the radicals in the Frankfurt School who... Yeah after seeing the failure of classical Marxism, thought, we're not going to bring about the cultural revolution we want via traditional class warfare. Right. That hasn't worked so far. We need to change tactics. We need to do it via cultural warfare instead. What is the most powerful motivator that most men have got? What can we snare them with? Sex. Yeah. This is what everyone wants. And this has this unique sway over people's ability to think clearly. Yes. And we talk well about said. sex mania. Yeah? yeah. You can be a sex maniac and it can control people in a way that perhaps nothing else in human life can, maybe because it's for most people, the most intense kind of pleasure that they get. It also mm -hmm. taps into this fact that we crave someone else. We're incomplete as we are. Mm -hmm. So it's a really fundamental drive. I mean, I would argue that's because we're built for family. But if you can convince someone that this is because you're built to just have sex as often as you can with as many people as possible, because that's somehow natural on this Darwinian, reductionist, materialistic view of human beings. Men, men in particular, women aren't built for that, but men are for, you know, you can look at them that way anyway. Yeah, exactly. Then if we can get guys to believe this, then we can effectively sit back and watch them do our work for us mm -hmm. of undermining the family, undermining their own masculinity yep. and weakening society, which the family is the foundation of. And we'll just create chaos. And all this chaos is going to need to be managed by an increasingly overbearing state that has to mop up the mess. Yep. And meanwhile, all these guys thinking they are alpha, we've got them by the balls, literally. Yes. Yeah. Well, you're talking about the book uh, Libido Dominandi by E. Michael Jones. I don't know if you've read that book, but I'm working my way through it now. And it's absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Like I think I'm up to Jung and Freud and to see, 
you know, I, I already um, have been questioning because again, part of that whole, you know, new age kind of secular world that I came from, <clears throat> Carl Jung <clears throat> was a big deal, right? And so I've been unwinding that, but to see in his, in, in E. Michael Jones's thesis about how what these men were essentially doing is playing father confessor to wealthy elites and, and essentially giving the rubber stamp of approval and absolution for their deviant sex practices, like that was where that was the core of, of Freudian and Jungian's Jung's practice. Maybe maybe their ideas weren't about that publicly, but in their practice, that that's what they were doing, and how that fed into the sexual revolution as, as well. And to understand that the wrecking ball that came and leveled, you know, uh, Western society started swinging in the French Revolution. I think that's I think that's the the next phase of dialogue that's happening because we're used to thinking about. Okay, when did when did the mess start? The 1960s. And some people now are looking back and saying, when did the mess start? World War I. And you can make that case too. When did the mess start? Industrial Revolution. Well, you can take it all the way back to the French Revolution and say, okay, it probably actually really started. I mean, if you I mean, we can go all the way back to a long time before that, but the French Revolution is being the 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 um the beginning of a lot of ideas that we're now sitting in the swamp of. It started in that in that particular moment. Yeah, I think that's a good connection to make. And also noting how so often in history, political revolution is accompanied by sexual revolution as well. Yeah. As in Russia, for example, where we see Alexandra Kolontai's attempts to try to make no divorce very easy, um, no fault divorce very easy, and also to abolish alimony so child support laws, and really make it as easy as possible for the family to dissolve. Again, because the family is the main core of society that they want to abolish. Now, that was disastrous then. It took mm -hmm. a, a few decades for them to realize it fully. But we don't seem to have learned the lesson. The people still calling for removal of biological fathers from the home with their children haven't learned the disastrous lessons of history. Mm -hmm. And I, you, you mentioned lust earlier as having a unique control over the, over the human being. And I think part of, I think part of it also is this, this idea today that we are these autonomous, you know, self-deterministic units and you can't tell me what to do with my body. I think there's an element of that as well, which I guess also goes back to Marxism, which is the reframing of, of power as being purely political, social, economic, and not moral. Yeah, it's a particular strain of liberalism defined as an overwhelming concern with autonomy as the most important thing in someone's life. It's just got to be freedom to do whatever they want, be whoever they want, and that terminates in trans ultimately. Yeah. as the demand for autonomy from biology. Like, I want to be free to choose my own sex. But you're right. That is what we get in the manosphere attitude to sex, which is that I, I want what I want. I don't really care about the impact on society. Just give me the, the cheap thrills. Give me the pleasure without responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I've got no real sense of duty towards the, the women that I am. Uh, exploiting and the children that might result from this fornication. Again, I've got no responsibility for them. And in some cases, they're also pro-abortion too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the that's the that's the tragedy of the whole thing is that you have so many people that are in the manosphere in particular or manosphere adjacent or whatever that are still talking about promiscuity in in 2022. Like, are you not aware that this is that if you're if you're if you're uh, anti-abortion, you cannot be pro promiscuity. And I don't think some guys have really plugged those two things in together. Yeah, there's a lot of cognitive dissonance, I think, about exactly what premises from their political opponents they're actually accepting. And like I said a minute ago, yeah. in many ways they agree with the feminists on the fundamentals, and that's why I think the manosphere is best characterized as a as a form of feminism in that it's anti-family yeah and I, and i think it's it's struggling to make that leap from 
being anti-family in its root to being pro-family now, but it it has no it has no grounding to do that, right? Like why is a why is a family better than than promiscuity? Well, because it's better for society. Well, why why is that a value? And and ultimately, it all boils down to Christ. And then, but making the leap to Christ, that leap of faith means you have to disavow your entire past. You have to say that this was all a giant mistake that I've been redeemed from. And some men just aren't aren't ready to get there yet. Which it's it's very difficult to watch that struggle kind of unfolding as the as the manosphere begins to as Christianity begins to impact the manosphere. And men are being forced to make or not make moral decisions. Yeah, and it's so painful for many of them that they will instead dismiss the very idea of any objective values or, yeah. or morality whatsoever. And they'll just say that we are naked apes and religion is all made up, morality is made up, and they can somehow create their own meaning from this. And I think the attraction of Nietzsche for many yep. of them is that it allows them to construct this narrative whereby it's just about the will to power and having sex with as many women as possible is what a man is supposed to be about. And this isn't something anyone else can judge. You might not like it, but your opinion is no better than theirs. Can we can we take apart Nietzsche for a minute? Because my my critique of that is always that okay, let's let's run it your way. And will to power is the highest goal, and the achievement of, of power is the highest aim. You as a man will eventually age. You will reach, you will, you will not, you you will not be able to be the most powerful man your entire life. You'll hit whatever, 35, 40, 50, pick it, 65, and you will no longer be the most powerful. When another man comes in and takes all your stuff you know, and, and takes your women and takes your, and, and, and ruins your legacy. Are you going to celebrate that as the vindication of your, of your worldview? Or are you going to complain and say, life isn't fair? Like more often than not, those guys are going to, they're not going to say like, yes, the triumph of my ideology, destroy me utterly. It's like, no, you don't actually say that. Like you don't actually believe in what you say you believe in. Yeah. That's a really important contradiction, isn't it? Because on the one hand, Nietzsche's idea is that there are no facts, only interpretations. And yet he wants to put that forward as a fact. <laughs> fact. He wants to tell us <laughs> it is true. Yes. So <laughs> just give me so one. Often, just give me one. <laughs> Self-contradiction is the touchstone of, of error in that sense. And the other odd contradiction at the heart of that Nietzschean worldview is that they will complain that the weak at some point in history, overpowered the strong. And if you think about that mm. for a second, that's an odd one. So <laughs> yes. the, the, the guys in the past who were really powerful and, and virtuous or whatever, the, the blonde beasts that Nietzsche talks about, they're the rightful rulers, but the, the pathetic betas and gammas and the feminists stole their power, um, ripped it out of their hands, mm. and we need to get things back to how they should be. Well, first of all, if there are no moral facts, there's no should be about it. Yeah. Like, there's nothing objectively bad about the current state of affairs. But also, why are they weak if they manage to actually take power? They're yep. stronger, aren't they? Look at what look at the results. Yep. They're running rampant through society and you're all complaining about how you're under the thumb. So they seem pretty strong to me. So it's incoherent in many ways. And this is also, this is the critique of that they would level of Christianity, like right? slave morality, right? That it's, that it's ultimately about self-sacrifice. Power is about self-sacrifice, not self-aggrandizement. That's the, that's Christ's whole story, you know, sacrificing himself for, for weak humanity. Like, oh no, we need to assert power over, over life instead. And it's, it's truly offensive to them, I think. Yeah. This is because it is difficult to understand restrained power as mm -hmm. true power. Chesterton has a really brilliant image about this when he says that if you give a weak man a sledgehammer and say, bring it down to this egg and stop it just on the shell so it won't crack, mm. he won't be able to do it. The hammer will follow through and crush the egg. Give a hammer to a really strong man and he'll be able to bring it down at full force and then bring it to a dead halt just as the hammer touches the shell 
and leave it intact. So true power, as anyone who's had an argument with a kid or been challenged to a fight by someone they know they could easily beat, true power is about not having small man syndrome and having to constantly prove yourself. It's about being meek, not getting irritated by things that don't really justify that response. It's about being able to walk away and magnanimity or having a a great soul, as Aristotle put it, is not descending to those petty examples of provocation. So Jesus could easily have vaporized all the people taking him to the cross, yeah. could have crushed them all, but the true power is actually completing the mission and restraining himself. And that's what the Viking chieftains, when they first heard about what happened to him couldn't understand. He said, well, if I was there, I wouldn't have let them take him. I would have killed all the Roman guards. So it was a big inversion of what the idea of heroism really is. But it was the only way to get the job done because otherwise the greatest heroes, Achilles, whoever it is, they just end, live by the sword, die by the sword and rotting in the grave. So it's, you're right. Christianity is quite a big challenge to the idea of masculinity. Mm. but it retains all that is noble and best in the pagan heroic code. Jesus refused pain relief on the cross, for example. Mm. He bleeds for everyone. He sacrifices himself. These are warrior virtues, but at the same time, he also transcends them. Well, and he also, what gets left out of the whole story is, yeah, he died on the cross and then he rose again, right? He, he, he defeated even death. Like that part gets left out. You know, yeah, yes, he suffered and died. Oh, look how weak he is. Like, and then he triumphed over death itself on the for the benefit of everybody. Don't forget that part. Yeah, exactly. So the only guy who has literally been to hell and back. <laughs> yes, true. True. And this was this was power, this was power restrained in, in service. That the most the most powerful man to ever live sacrif like sacrificed his physical material power for spiritual power. Right. And, and, and that calculation, if you're, if you're a materialist, if you're a Nietzschean, if you're a Marxist, does not make sense. Because the only thing in your, in your worldview is material power, is the acquisition of, of stuff. But if you understand that spiritual power is a very different kind of power that Im involves seeing with more than just your eyes, then the story reveals itself in its, its pure beauty. But uh, you have to be able to see past the acquisitiveness that I think drives our, our I don't want to say our modern era because it's older than that, but that drives many, many men. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And it's also a form of weakness if you can't resist temptation. If you have to gratify every impulse of lust that comes your way, in a sense, you are overpowered by it. You're too weak yeah. to actually control yourself. So let's take an example of a porn addict, for example, who is constantly swiping four or five hours a day. These guys exist glued mm -hmm. to their smartphones because they're yeah. too weak to just put it down, switch it off, and walk away. That's not masculine. And in the same way, the man who can't control his eyes when he walks down the street and sees women around him, especially if he's married, he is also weak. Mm -hmm. So the message that Jesus has is about restraint. Again, it's about being in true control of yourself. And this is really what being a man consists in. Physically, mentally, spiritual, it's that discipline. And if people had understood that at the time of the sexual revolution, then the weaponization of lust wouldn't have worked against them. And the only way back out of this mess right now is the weaponization of chastity in a counterattack. Interesting. Let's let's kick that. Let's kick the weaponization of chastity. Like I see that happening, and I think I've I think I've had something similar, <clears throat> not in those words floating around inside my head, but I've definitely seen a shift in the way that I approach Twitter, uh, in particular, where I talk about. I don't really talk about it so much on on Instagram, but this idea of, of weaponized chastity, weaponized chastity, weaponized virtue, but a very particular, a very particular virtue that I think has a lot of appeal. Because I think a lot of boys in particular are looking at their 
at their brothers or at their fellows being addicted, addicted to porn and they're seeing it out there and they're aware of the need to restrain themselves and they're very open to it now in a way that maybe they wouldn't have been 20 years ago and they're recognizing they're recognizing something like you see this all the time with what you do so maybe you could share more about that i think it's become painfully clear to many people that after they take the first couple of steps on that road of promiscuity porn they see a dead end in front of them it's happened to too many men and in that darkness just like if you switch the light out in your room your pupils get wider trying to take in more light like you can kind of see better in a way your vision becomes more sensitive mm -hmm. so things are getting dark now and i think that means that people with the eyes to see are starting to wake up a bit in a way that maybe a few decades ago might have been harder for them to do mm -hmm. when the initial playboy messaging was coming out um superficially it looks appealing doesn't it you can get all these girls you can live free you can have the money the fast cars all the rest of it mm. i mean the the danger was there in the word play boy you, yeah. you are just living life as a boy there people yeah. should have spotted that one but there's a kind of emptiness that especially when guys get middle-aged and certainly in old age you just end up lonely and the life expectancy for unmarried guys is a lot lower they tend to have less money as well, less happiness. They get sick more easily, all kinds of problems, depression too. So there's enough people around now who have pushed it to its limit to learn from so that we know that there must be a better alternative. So weaponization of chastity then, what does it really look like? Well, in many ways, a return to what's been taught for the majority of human history, which is that the strongest man is the man who can conquer himself. I really like that because I was the question that I had running in my head was how do you make chastity sexy? Right. And that, and, and I think you just, you just squared that circle in a way to say, you know, the strong man is able to restrain himself and that's true strength. Because that's what is it that what is it that men want? Is they want to know that they're strong on some level. They want many things, but that's one of the things that they want. So how do you how do you frame it in a way that that um, that makes it more appealing or more pleasurable in quotes than than just pure pleasure and and the experience of virtue, the experience of restrained strength and nobility as a man is a far higher pleasure than mere pleasure. That's right. And if we'd only listened to the traditional stories warning us about this, then we'd have seen the signs. So you've got Solomon, you've got David, you've got Samson, all these biblical figures who essentially are warning us about the dangers of men who can't control their lust, falling into honey traps, and also the consequences for their kingdoms bringing ruin. You've even got it in some of the early like pulp fiction sci-fi. There's a Conan story about the frost giants where he's led off into the, the snowy wastelands by this shimmering, beautiful woman who is in the snow wearing only the, the thinnest garment. And he's basically maddened by lust for her. He follows her over into the mountains and her two brothers are waiting there, these massive frost giants, to jump him, to kill him. So it's something that is in literature, mythology, religion, on a very deep level. And I think that's why it was tapped into and why it's worked so effectively to try to undermine men. That's the cruel twist, isn't it? Yeah. You, you get people at the exact point that they think makes them most powerful, most masculine, makes them feel most virile. And yet that's the exact thing they need to learn how to restrain to be truly manly. And it's this, it's this inversion of, of positioning vice as virtue, right? Like, like you're, you're, and this this happens for women as well, right? It, particularly in in the release of of lust, the weaponization of lust is like, oh, you're you're more of a man if you have a higher if you have a higher notch count. Like, oh, you're smashing the patriarchy, woman, if you have a high body count. Yeah, and it undermines womanhood in the same way that it undermines manhood. I think women realize it faster mm. because biologically they have to invest so much more into reproduction 
at least in the early stages than men do. So look at an egg compared to sperm, for example. Women have to gestate internally as well. All the investment of lactation as well. Mm -hmm. So women in general tend to be more cautious with how they invest their sexual energy. And you can even look up some of the stats on people ending up in ER departments for sexual mishaps. This is quite comical. Men are much more likely to be in ER with a foreign body stuck inside themselves than women are. <laughs> Men are much yeah. more likely to be um, homosexual than women are. Yep, there are more gays than there are lesbians. Hmm. Men are also more likely to be involved in bestiality as well. So men compared to women cheap, uh, treat sex more cheaply. So what we've seen then, I think, is that women have cottoned on to the idea that promiscuity doesn't work and uh, they've been left feeling hollow, empty, without the family a lot faster than men have. Mm. Well, because it's, it's, it's more immediate for them to feel the impact. Right. Like a, a man can go, a man can go many years before he recognizes, wow, I feel empty. I should probably find a partner before. I mean, how many, how many sexual encounters would it take a woman to say, wow, this experience with this guy is really, is really empty. Or these, these guys are really empty. Maybe I'd like someone to actually stick around for a change. Right. I think men real will realize that later in their lifespan, if only because um, <clears throat> the reproductive window for for women is much shorter than for men. That's right. Yeah. And I think there's a sense in which, although declining marriage rates mean that sex overall for men is going down, men who can get sex without marriage have basically had their main motivation already satisfied. So mm. what do they really need to strive for now? For a while, they might feel like they got everything they want. It's only later when they realize that the point of that impulse in the first place was ultimately to find fulfillment in family. That's what it's really driving them towards. But they can feel like they've ticked off all the big things in their life relatively early. If you've got a, a job, you've got a car, and you're able to, to fornicate apparently without a consequence, then great, right? Mm -hmm. It would seem great. Like Again, and you pointed this out with regard to, to Playboy magazine, which uh, it started in 1953. Right. Yeah. So we're so we're thinking about, you know, the, the sexual revolution is taking place in the 60s. The groundwork was being laid way before then. And so and, and I'm trying to figure out, like putting myself back in time. What is it now? 70 years. Like how those how that those values would have been appealing to men coming out of World War Two. Like they just experienced the horrors of war. And what kind of men would be like, oh, endless girls are what's are what's appealing. But that aside, you know, you point out the emptiness of what happens later in a man's life when he hasn't had children or hasn't had children at an age where he can really be present with them and 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 when men's uh, life expectancy declines and all that, that the promise that Playboy magazine was making to men was ultimately an empty one. Yeah, and the, the, the promise of feminism for women is also empty and the child suffers most of all, if we think that sex is supposed to be about procreation and then providing for children, educating them, what has it actually ended up in? Well, the sexual revolution has turned that on its head because we've now got abortion rates skyrocketing. Yeah. We've got children being neglected. We've got broken homes and we've got social instability rather than cohesion. So everything that sex is supposed to be aimed at naturally, we've taken it in the opposite direction. And you can't carry on like that. It will eventually get scuppered on the rocks of reality, just like the socialist revolution was. It doesn't fit human nature. Aquinas just puts this in one sentence. He says, human nature rebels against the promiscuous union of the sexes. Wow. Children need stability. They need family stability. That's what marriage is about. And if you try to do without that, then you're going against the grain of what you are as a as a creature, naturally. I mean, isn't the goal to scupper 
civilization on the rocks, right? Isn't, isn't that the purpose of the whole thing? Like that is the purpose of the Marxist project. Like they have no plan B. Their plan A is to wreck everything in the hope that the utopian state will rise out of the ashes. That's literally the, the statement. That's, that is what they are doing. Yeah, it marks everything that exists deserves to burn. It's ultimately Luciferian. Yeah. But the point is that you can't scupper human nature because it never changes. That's something that's God given. Your, your plan to scupper it will eventually fail. I'm not saying it's going to be defeated by a calm, dispassionate argument and weighing up the pros and cons. Mm. That's not how things work because humans aren't purely rational and logical. That's why I think one of the, the fundamental assumptions of liberalism that uh, free speech will solve all our problems doesn't actually work. So J.S. Mill's argument in Liberty that if we just let the marketplace of ideas sort things out, eventually the truth will rise to the top. No. Uh, Pascal, Christian philosopher, he points out that very often people hate the truth. Yeah. especially if it regards morality. Yeah. People don't want to hear it. It hurts them. Yeah. So they'll go for the attractive lie that seems good instead. So if we check in on the marketplace of ideas now, looking around on Twitter for five seconds, looking in the news, well, would we say that the good ideas have risen to the top? No. Well, this is, this, this gets to a very interesting question where I, to bring us back somewhere to Nietzsche, you know, where this will to power, like, are, are we talking about the forceful imposition of ideas on people, right? Like if we're talking, I don't know how to square this, right? This idea that I, I agree with you that simply making passion, dispassionate, reasoned debate <clears throat> is insufficient, is insufficient in the marketplace of ideas. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even if you, even if you set the playing field as equal. And you don't algorithmically bias something one way or another, which which we know all social media platforms do. You still have this this notion that people will resist, as you just said, and which which I know is true. They'll resist moral conviction, right? It's built in. It's built into them. It's built into their sin nature. But at a certain point, a, a set of um, a set of ideas about how to organize society has to win, right? It has to be what globalism. Localism, uh, globalism, tribalism, or nationalism, secularism versus uh, versus Christianity. There's no third option, right? New Ages, all, all these other pagan religions are essentially secularism when you boil them down, or mysticism, really. So how how does a a, a pop a, a proper positive way of organizing society get imposed on society when society rebels against it? When the individuals of society rebel against it? Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, the, the question you're raising there, asking about imposing views, is really a question about authority and, and hierarchy. And I suppose the fundamental thing we're looking at is, can you have any society without some kind of authority? Even if we start with the most fundamental society of the family, well, what's the authority there naturally? the father. We've said that all human societies have been patriarchies and it means ruled by fathers. That's where men get their authority from. And it extends from that into the community at large. So if we start with that assumption, what are we looking at? Well, parents who might encourage critical discussion of ideas for their children, for example, but you're not going to give them completely unfiltered access to all kinds of things that might be morally damaging for them. Like mm -hmm. even my teenage daughters, they have their screen time, they have filters, and I'm not going to let them read and watch some things because I know that even though they might in the end figure out those ideas are bad, they're too attractive for them right now. Mm -hmm. And yeah, truth does be error in the long run, but a lot of disastrous stuff can happen in that long run that a concerned parent can just stop from happening by saying, you're not looking at that film. You're not listening to that music. Mm -hmm. You're not going to read that book. Maybe later when you're older. And in the same way, applying that principle of benevolent authority to society at large, that's what we get regarding free speech. So 
there's never been any society that hasn't proscribed speech to some extent in the areas of morality. So this idea of a complete no holds barred system where we just trust people to make up their own minds and do the right thing. We don't really get that. Mm. There's some form of heresy, some form of taboo in every culture throughout history. I think the difference is now that we don't really know what those are. We, they're trying to pretend that we've got this diverse viewpoint free for all. We all know that's not the case. And you can tr cross the invisible tripwire and now you're a, a heretic. Now you get cancelled. Mm. It's just we're not sure exactly what the line is. Whereas before the Catholic Church, for example, had the index of prohibited books on the list. These are the ones we think are bad for your soul and you shouldn't be reading. So mm -hmm. free speech isn't really a value in itself. It's to help us get to the truth. And the truth is a value. But to say that free speech itself is the main thing and all we want is just to be open-minded rather than having something to actually close our minds on and mm. cherish as the truth is, as Chesterton put it, to say like, we always have to be open-mouthed without ever having to actually shut our mouths and eat and digest. Open-mouthed for what? Poison? Excrement? What else are you going to have in your mouth? Same thing as with your mind or your heart. What are you going to consume? We want something that's nutritious, don't we? So error as opposed to truth doesn't really have any rights. So we don't have the right just to spread falsehood, for example, to children in the education system that might be damaging to them morally. So uh, let, me, let me level a challenge to that. So, so, comparing, so comparing teenage children, girls or boys, right, to... Um, to grown, let's say educated, educated adults, those two things don't really, don't really map, right? Like the, like the, the intellectual capacity of a man like you is very different from the intellectual capacity of a, say a 10 year old, right? So, so in that, in that way of uh, seeing things, how would you say that a man of man of your capacity should not be permitted to even experience or read books? Or maybe you're not going to chew, swallow or digest them, or even let them into your mouth. But is 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 letting something into your eyes equivalent to letting like I don't mean to dispute Chesterton, love Chesterton, but is is it this is it the same thing to be chewing extra excrement? Like okay, reading Marquis de Sade, Justine, for example, like yeah, we can we can say at that level, right? But do those things really fully map for for humans that are properly cultivated? Let's put it that way, adult humans who are properly cultivated. The idea of a properly cultivated human is a really interesting one because do we ever achieve that the the catholic church would say that all of us as fallen creatures are naturally more inclined to vice than to virtue mm -hmm. that's what concupiscence is so unless we're careful and fight against it constantly we are tending towards disorder like we're really difficult Always. creatures to control. It's a daily battle. And there's never a point where we reach a moment where we can just press save and all our progress is secure. And if you look at the lives of the saints, they are the ones who are most aware that they're under attack from the devil. It's like the harder you progress towards sanctity, the greater the attacks become. I think that's partly because you're more aware of what's bad within yourself, but also because there probably is really a greater assault on you. So how is this relevant to questions of free speech then? Well, I would say let's compare a, a drug kingpin who currently the law would penalize for having a really destructive impact on society. If you're like a, a cartel boss who's distributing heroin and you get caught you're going to jail most of the time at least you should be mm. now what about someone who is at the moment in charge of a big porn company for example and distributing that what is his impact on millions of grown men who can apparently think for themselves and know right from wrong and they can weigh up all the literature on porn 
and see what it's likely to do to their lives. Well, if they read the research papers, they'd know they'd probably end up suicidal and impotent. That's what it says. And divorced, unable to have sex with the real woman because they will stop finding human beings attractive, possibly move towards things that they currently find abhorrent, repulsive, but porn will slowly titillate them and change the way their brains are structured so they need novel stimulus each time to be able to get aroused before, before finally ending up like in uh, Dante's hell, right at the center mm -hmm. of it. It's not even fire. It's just ice. Mm -hmm. It's just numbness. You don't even care anymore. Well, why can't they just make their own minds up? They're all smart. They're adults. They're rational. They can read the literature out there. The answer is it doesn't really work like that. They're not purely rational. And it would be better if porn kingpins distributing their content were treated in the same way that drug kingpins are. That's what we mean by authority in a society acting for the common good. So we don't think that the freedom of people to consume porn, the freedom of people to distribute it is a genuine freedom at all because freedom is ultimately freedom to pursue what is objectively good and what befits a, a proper fulfilled human life. It's not just liberty conceived as license to do whatever the hell you want. So, okay. So we're in agreement about porn. I'm, I'm thinking in this case, for example, about books, like here's this giant list of books that you're not allowed to, that you're not allowed to read. So it's strictly ideational, right? So to, so one of the things that could happen from that is if you don't allow people the opportunity to even experience these ideas, they lack a sense of perspective about why they should not experience the ideas. How bad could it possibly, how bad could it possibly be? I've never, so this, this benevolent authority <clears throat> over my whole life has determined that I should not read, let's just say five books, not even mm -hmm. with illustrations. They're just these five books, right? And so, and so people lose the sense of contact with, mm. and, and, and again, like I'm not talking about <clears throat> men, atomized men like we have today. Like we mm. have men that have been isolated from family structures, isolated from religious structures, isolated from social structures, having to make moral decisions on their own, second by second using their web browser. I'm thinking of something very different where men exist in community, where men exist in honor groups, where men have cultivated consciences, right? Where, where they're, they're far more uh, well integrated than they are today. The idea that, that these ideas embodied in books, people should not be men properly cultivated in such a way should not experience them, I think has a ditch on the other side of the road, which is that, oh, well, you know, who, it can't possibly be that bad. And then you create a longing for it as well, right? Yeah, sure. So I see what you're saying. Now, how did the Catholic Church come up with the index of prohibitive books? Well, a bunch of guys sat down and read them, talked about them, and <laughs> said, know, yeah. you know what? These are the ones we don't want distributed at large. These are the ones we shouldn't be teaching in schools, etc." So if we take a parallel with, with sex, um, Aquinas didn't even think that prostitution should be illegal, right? It should be illegal. Yeah, he, he said it shouldn't be um, illegal. Prostitution shouldn't be illegal. You can't control people to that extent. We have to recognize that the function of law isn't to try to punish all sin possible. We only okay. want to look at things that might have a really grave effect on society at large. So am I saying that um, an academic or just someone who is really interested in pursuing his intellectual journey down all kinds of avenues shouldn't be able to read the list of books that the Catholic Church has said are prohibited. No, you should take very seriously okay. the fact that they are saying that these are the ones we think could be damaging to you morally. And if he wants to go ahead and read them and then grapple with the ideas and figure out and say, in most cases, right, I see why that's on the list. <laughs> that's different from saying that we're going to pump out these ideas into schools. We're going to pump these okay. ideas into the media. We're going to put them out on the internet. We're going to base all our MTV music songs around these kinds of concepts as well. That's where you start to get into the area where you, you cross the line between mm -hmm. someone just considering them in isolation 
And then what Aquinas is talking about, where we get grave impact on society at large. Mm -hmm. It's like the fact that you can, in the UK, you can currently, um, steroid use is legal in some ways, but to supply it and to be the guy pushing it out, that's not, yeah? Yeah. So I guess we're, yes. Okay. This is great because this is the, the, the ditch on either sides of the free speech road. Like if you're, if you're say a free speech absolutist, which many men say they are, then you run into the situation like, well, why, why shouldn't we just be pumping porn into everyone's lives? It's free speech, right? Let them sort it out on their own. And then the, the counter argument is always, is always on the side of authority, censorship being taken too far. So how do we, how do we find that middle path to say, you know, these are the ideas that we've determined are truly corrosive and toxic to society, destructive to everything that we, that we value. And on the other, and on the other side, you can't expect to eradicate them entirely, right? If you try, someone was saying, I don't remember where, but if you try to eradicate all murder, the, the, the controls that you have to put on society will be so oppressive that it'll be counterproductive to the effort. So that's what you're saying with Aquinas as well. So how do we find yeah. our way down that middle road <clears throat> which is some form of, of authority and this takes us all the way back to patriarchy right this takes us always all, all the way back to this idea what authority are we all going to submit to terrestrially right For, we can submit to a moral authority we can submit to our brother's authority but what is that actually going to look like in a reconstructed in a reconstructed society and so maybe we maybe we can talk about integralism very briefly as well which i i, I really love that article by the way and I want to save a few minutes to talk about your background in lifting, if we could do that as well. But let's talk about integralism first. Uh, the point you just made there about what uh, free speech is really for and are we an absolutist or not, that's fundamental because it is for helping us pursue knowledge and virtue. Mm. And we think about the kind of limits we want on free speech in that we know that error and truth don't have equal rights. Strictly speaking, hmm. error has no rights at all. Free speech is valuable because truth is valuable because that's what we're built for as human beings. Now, the skeptical idea that, but who can hmm. really decide what's true? We don't really know what's true. We can't say <laughs> that these books aren't true, that we know that's false. Right. So there are gray areas, but we can also tell that some ideas are absurd, destructive, damaging. And even if it's the case that some people might find them initially plausible and they say, but let the marketplace of ideas sort it out, mm. we'll say that's likely to lead to so much chaos and damage to the common good <laughs> that it's better for us to, because it's the lesser of the evils, to just say, no, we are restricting the distribution of that content. How's that relevant to integralism? Well, it's about what the purpose of the state is. What is the state supposed to do for human beings? And the answer is that it is to let us know about and help us towards our final end. And we are very unusual now living in a society where secularism is so mainstream. And you basically got this idea that nobody knows what the purpose of human life is. Nobody knows what the value of it is. Maybe it's got no more value than the life of an ant, for example, or a plant, mm -hmm. as some vegans would go to that extreme. They do, yeah. Yep. There's no objective meaning, value, or purpose to human life whatsoever. Now, that, to the vast majority of humans who've ever lived, is totally insane. Instead, <laughs> we've got the idea that humans aren't mere animals we have a grander destiny or purpose than that we can think we have a component to us that is going to survive death if you look at the big monotheistic religions christianity islam judaism they all agree on many fundamental things and in the west this has meant that as plato put it the purpose of law is to help citizens become virtuous like we want to be guided towards a good life by the society we live in mm. now i think it's difficult for that to do that because abortion being legal for example 
gay marriage being legal, porn being legal to distribute en masse. Mm -hmm. This can make people think that all kinds of bad choices, because they are legal, are actually morally good. So living a good life is tougher in many ways than it should be if mm -hmm. the state was doing its duty properly. Now, if anyone is kind of bristling at this idea that authority can be a good thing, it just shows how deeply you have drunk of the liberal Kool-Aid, the libertarian who thinks that the state shouldn't ever be interfering and people should be left to do their own thing. That's a very extreme position. And it's just a strain of liberalism, ultimately. Mm. And given what human nature is, some kind of authority is important for order. Some kind of hierarchy is important for society to function, for the family to function. So we've got the idea that the state is benevolent in encouraging people to see their rights as basically just forms of duties to each other for the common good. Mm -hmm. So I don't have a right to an abortion, for example. If I just feel like I do, then no, where does that lead? Well, maybe I feel like I have a human right for free internet access, porn, and the holiday paid for by the government at least once a year. Right. That's where we end up. If a right mm -hmm. is just something that you feel like you have because you've got this vague feeling of dignity, then, well, maybe I've got the right to incest. The German Medical Council argued for the decriminalization of incest in 2014. Uh, what happens if someone's into pedophilia? Maybe they've got the right to do that if love mm -hmm. is love. What about necrophilia? Where does it end? If it's just the right to do something, then, and it's your feeling, mm -hmm. who's to tell you no? So once you lose any conception of what the common good is and what the purpose of human life is, based on this idea of man as a, a rational animal, then we're kind of in the mess that we're in today. So we need to go back to first principles and figure out what the actual philosophical anthropology of man is. Like what is a human being? Mm -hmm. And I think people are actually aware of that and grasping at that question in a confused way when they're asking now, like, what's a woman? Like, we don't even know anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's uh, you you touched on an idea that I've that I've been kicking around related to the manosphere is that the manosphere is very good at saying what men do. It is not good at saying what men are for, and those are two very different questions. And so you mentioned that with regard to free speech, like what does free speech do? Well, what what about what is free speech for? And that's a question that doesn't that doesn't get asked. Like, why do we actually have free speech as opposed to just having it for the sake of having it? And I and I understand the arguments in that that if you constrain speech in certain ways, et cetera. And I understand that it, for the phase where the manosphere was very successful, that men didn't even know what men do, so they sought to answer that question first. And now there's a now there's actually a question of purpose rising. Like, okay, now that we've figured out what it is that men do, because we didn't know for a long time, what are men actually for? And that's the uncomfortable question, because what's the principle that you use to answer that question? You know, what's the principle that you use to say, what is something for? What is the telos of it? Well, where are you going to turn to for that answer, right? Yeah, and that's the big question that politics is ultimately all about, because it's just a branch of moral philosophy in mm -hmm. that to say we need to have these political policies, why do we? Oh, because they're good. Why are they good? Why? Yeah. Yep. Why are they good for human beings? What is it about the human creature that means that these policies are the good ones? And that is what integralism at its core is about, that the, the function of the state is for the common good and for humans to flourish within it. And it, it helps us to live good lives. But if you've got I, no conception of the good, then you can't do that. And then flourishing has to be defined as more than <clears throat> just your free and unbridled authentic self-expression, which is, which is how it's framed now. Yeah. You, you can't flourish as a promiscuous drug addict whose life is filled with abortion. That's not flourishing, even if you think it is. Right. And then, well, that's the liberal project, right? You know, the liberal project is to say, because I want to do it, because it's my self-expression, it's therefore good. 
right? And so, and, and, and the expression of it is a virtue and anything that constrains the performance of that virtue is a vice or is oppression. So you have to destroy all controls on me as an individual so I can fully express myself even unto my own self-destruction. Right. And even not stopping at my biological sex. Yeah. And I think what we'll see in the future is, or even my species. So yeah. I feel like I'm a unicorn. That's my self-expression. I want autonomy from the fact that I'm a mere human being. Mm -hmm. I want to have all kinds of AI hop-ups so I can create myself as I see fit. In a word, I want to be God. And that's why we were talking earlier about the enlightenment project of mastery over nature. It ends in mastery over human nature and in what is good for us. We want to be able to decide that. Yeah. And, and, and now with the, this is transhumanism, right? Like I was watching a video yesterday about, you know, technological wombs, right? Like this idea that you can raise a child and like an infant, a, a fetus, an embryo and a pod. <clears throat> and that's, that's where it all leads. That's where it all leads. And then from there, why doesn't it lead to, you know, you can, you can augment yourself technic technologically. Why doesn't it lead to a, meta a metaverse where you can let your physical body wither and live in exclusively in the digital realm? Why doesn't it lead there? Well, of course, naturally it does. It's the logical conclusion of the worldview. Yep, exactly it. And to avoid that logical conclusion, you have to dispute the premises, which is that we are atomized, disconnected individuals who aren't fundamentally built for family. That's where it goes wrong right at the outset. And that's why I think the return to family and that harmony between men and women for the benefit of children and monogamy is a natural expression of human nature. And by natural, I mean what actually fits, what kind of being we are. So all the most successful societies have been monogamous. Mm -hmm. A.D. Unwin's book, Section Culture, uh, is clear on this. If the red pill, as the manosphere put it, is just a praxeology, it's just about what works pragmatically, why does it work so badly? Why has the society that's taken it further than anywhere else, the inner city ghetto, the most mm -hmm. disordered, the most dysfunctional, if promiscuity works, according to you, why are the results so disastrous? If monogamy is unnatural, why does it produce the most successful civilizations? Why does it mean that we outbreed even polygamous societies, multiple wives, let alone promiscuous ones? Why does promiscuity mean chaos, death, depression, if it works? The answer is it doesn't work. I mean, I think that their argument would be and not that I agree with this, but there would be some resistance to even saying, to even making a moral value judgment on those societies, right? What does it, what does it mean to work, right? <clears throat> because you have all these hyper-masculine guys running gangs and stuff like that. Look, that works. They've will to power. Congratulations. You did it, right? That would be, maybe that would be the, that would be the, the very weak found foundations argument they would make in response. Yeah. In which case, look, if we're going to play the game that there are no moral values, What's wrong with feminism, objectively? Mm -hmm. You complain about it a lot, but you've got no grounds for saying it's wrong. Yeah, we've been touching on all the contradictions at the heart of all this that you can see with laser-like precision into the heart of it. Like, wait, what about that? Cancelled. So, yeah. so I know that I know that you've got to go in a moment, but I did want to talk to you about about uh, powerlifting because I think this is really important. That a lot of these in, enormous ideas. It's very easy to get lost in them. And, and as we're talking about loose touch with physical reality, and as you and I were chatting about yesterday, the barbell roots you into physical reality in these really important ways that you highlighted. So I wonder if you can talk about your background doing that, how it's played into your own life um, and how it plays into your life now. Sure. Yeah. I, if I'm not careful, I'll spend a lot of my time just in my head reading books or walking around just toying around with whatever idea I might have picked up from something I've heard or read. So I like the barbell for the reason that you explained, which is it's a, a connection to physical reality. And I also feel like there's something that takes you back to the past about it, whether it's the feeling of the sword or the axe or the plow or whatever it might be. I think we are made for 
labor. I mean, one of Adam's punishments after the fall is that he's going to work the earth. He's going mm-hmm. to work with his body, the sweat of his brow. So it, it's part of what fulfills us as men. The, the woman's punishment is the pains of childbirth. But mm-hmm. for men, it's labor specifically. Yeah. And you'll often find that guys who don't have any kind of hard physical element to their lives end up frustrated. Like luxury is not good for us. Softness isn't good for us. Definitely not physically. I mean, everyone can see that quite quickly, that a man with no physical challenge in his life isn't as healthy objectively, physically, as mm-hmm. a man who does have it. But mentally and spiritually, that can be a bit harder to spot, but people feel it eventually. Now, what kind of mental benefits or spiritual benefits can you get from barbell training? I think one of the big ones is just patience and humility, because often if you try to force progress, you'll just end up hurt and backtrack and make slower progress than you would than if you just focused on getting the work done and just accepting the results are going to be what they be and you can't really speed them up much. You even see this with guys trying to take the shortcut and use steroids, for example. The muscles will often grow faster than the tendons or Mm -hmm. the ligaments and they can get all kinds of injuries because the body hasn't actually caught up to their strength yet. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an important lesson about ambition, pride, humility, taking things slowly. And then the other point is that you're often not as strong as you think you are. So I found this, especially at competitions, you might go in with some numbers in mind that you want to lift. And then after you've done it a few times, you realize that it's normally best to dial it back by about five to 10% from whatever you're imagining you're going to be capable of, Mm. because that's just a fact as well. You can let your ego run away with you sometimes unless you're not careful. So um, how do we prevent on the other side of the ditch, the, the ditch on the other side of the road, men from worshiping the barbell? Like, cause we can talk about the way that the barbell augments spiritual values. How can spiritual values augment the barbell practice? That's a good question because you can easily fall into the error of idolizing the body. And that is actually a, a big component of gay culture going all the way back to classical Greece, the cult of Adonis. So idolatry of the body, then what does it forget? That the body is ultimately to be put at the, the service of others. It, its purpose, as we see on the cross, is self-sacrifice and to bleed. So why is a father, for example, doing a good thing by going to the gym, assuming that he's not going to be spending too much time and it'll be to the detriment of his family duties? Well, it's good because it's good for the family to have a physically strong healthy father who's going to be able to protect them better or provide for them better. It's good because he's going to be less likely to get sick in some ways. It's going to be harder to kill. Quality of life is going to be better. These are all things that benefit the family. And rather than treating his body as something that is uh, precious and that he wouldn't ever endanger for them, he wouldn't want to get a, a blemish on it or hurt himself somewhere because he wants to keep it in pristine condition. No, it's always about, I'm willing to lay it down for you at any moment. And you can see that connection between um, masculine physical prowess and sacrifice, even among some of the high points in pagan culture as well. I'm not saying that the ancient Greeks were all about um, sodomy and the, the cult of the oiled up wrestler who was idolized by the people who would want to go and pay huge amounts of money to sleep with him because that was a real thing Mm -hmm. in Roman culture as well, the cult of the bathhouses. Instead, if you look at someone like Alexander the Great, who when he was crossing the deserts into Persia, um, was hearing his men talking about wanting to turn back like their water had run out it was tough the march was taking a long time he poured out his own water what he had left onto the sands 
and said, look, I'm in the same situation as you. We won't be turning back and stripped naked in front of the whole army and said, look at my body. All the scars are on the front. Now I've got these fighting for you, fighting for us. Look at the rear. I've got no marks here because I've never turned to run away. And I've always been at the front and my body's been between you, between the enemy. I haven't been watching from the back. And that point that his body, which they all knew was capable of leading the charge and had killed so many enemies and done so much for them, was ultimately being put in danger for them. So the point of the masculine capabilities, the strength, speed, whatever it was, was that he was endangering himself for the benefit of the whole army. That stuck. And the guys went into battle with him. They carried on going. Same thing for a father and a family. Can I, can I ask you a couple more questions? Do you have time for yeah. that? I, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm, I'm so interested to know, like, it's a, it's a thing to be an instructor at Eton. As I didn't even, I didn't know what Eton was to the degree that you explained it to me. And so it's, it takes a man's unique life path. And plus, I've read a lot of your writing, um, getting ready for this interview and watch the, the, the patriarchy video. And so I'm so interested in the life path that, that has brought you up to this moment. Like, to, to fuse together Catholicism and powerlifting and these really rich intellectual traditions and historical education. And I, I saw you answer a question on a live stream. How many hours a day do you spend reading? Like, I'm, I'm so curious about the, uh, the influences of your life that made you the man that you were up until the point where you entered Eaton. Right. And because I'm, I'm, I'm understanding a little bit how you got from Eaton to here. Right. But who like talk a little bit about your upbringing, um, and your education and, and the influences that shaped you, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. So both grandparents were really into literature and mm. history. So whether there's a genetic component to it, I don't know, but they had big libraries and I inherited a library from one of them mostly, and then many books from the other two. So that kind of got me interested in in reading, even just things like myths, legends, Shakespeare, whatever it might be at quite a young age and always buy me books for Christmas. And I was going to just a, a normal uh, state school in the UK. So don't have to pay any money to go to it. But they, the teachers there would um, notice that I'd find some of the work easy and like chuck extra books at me and say, oh, look at this one, uh, do this extra project. And then ended up getting a um, a scholarship to the local fee paying school and my parents wouldn't otherwise have been able to afford it but they thought that I'd benefit from going there and the English teacher there wasn't someone who taught you just to pass the test you could see that he was really interested in the books just for their own sake and would do things like host extra lessons at lunchtime that I would go to with a couple of friends and say, hey, look, I read this interesting article on Nietzsche that I thought you guys might like. Why don't we have a look at this? Or let's have a look at some of this modernist poetry and see what makes it unique compared to the era beforehand, even though it's not to do with the exam. So there's always that sense that reading books is just important because the ideas matter. And what a human being is ultimately built for is cultivating his mind in this way. So even at university, um, when I was quite busy with whatever the set texts were for the course, and I was reading English language and literature there, I'd always be just pursuing things that were often not going to be examined, completely unrelated to anything I, I had to be learning. So I think that explains some of the, like, the breadth of interests. And then passionate about it too, because... It's always been questions that I've been encouraged to see as like genuinely mattering. Like it matters if you get stuff right or wrong. There are real world consequences to it in terms of how you see yourself, how you see your family as well, and your, your place within society. And I think that's one of the, the biggest motivators that men should have for wanting to develop themselves intellectually, which is that ideas have consequences mm. and the stakes are very high. Like in a sense, they couldn't be higher for the Christian perspective anyway, in terms of the 
ultimate <coughs> prospect of heaven or hell. Like you're mm -hmm. supposed to to read, study, pray as if your life depends on it, because in a sense it really does. But also in terms of what we're seeing now all around us with the breakdown of society, this is a consequence of people being misled by bad ideas about what being a man is. So my motivation has always been about truth and trying to get things right. Partly, that's why I went into teaching as well, because I think that we've been handed on, we've been passed down this tradition, our, our cultural heritage, and it's not going to just do that for the next generation itself. Mm -hmm. Someone has to be the torchbearer. Culture comes from the Latin for like cultivating. Mm -hmm. You have to till the intellectual earth. You have to tend to it. Otherwise, it's going to get barren or full with weeds. And I think that's what we've happened, what we've seen happen in the many men are rootless in that they don't know what the Western tradition has to say about virtue. How many even know that virtue etymologically comes from strength and that comes from man? Virtue comes from Latin for man. That's how fundamental it is. So part of this has been deliberate. Solzhenitsyn said that to destroy a people, you must first sever their roots. Mm -hmm. And if there's one thing education does really well nowadays for the average guy, it's leave him rootless and confused. So I hope to try to help people reconnect to their roots to better resist some of these ideas. And then Eton as an institution, although I realize I was mistaken now, um, meant a lot to me because mm -hmm. of that sense of embodying tradition. But as I've explained, sadly, it's those elite traditional institutions that for obvious reasons are the ones that are most targeted and prized by the people wanting to impose change from the top down. Mm -hmm. Do you still hear from students while you were an instructor there? Because I can, what I, what I, I hear that the way this, this, this teacher really made an impact on you by opening you up to the world of ideas outside of what's needed to perform for the test or an exam. Like, here's some things to explore. And I imagine that you offered that same spirit to your students. Do you ever hear from them about the impact you've made in their lives? Yeah, I'll get some emails every now and again. Some of them will join in on live streams on YouTube. So if I've helped to uh, enable someone to enjoy books, even though all their exams are over, that's a big gift you can give someone. That's what I was given at school. And I'd like to try and repay that debt of gratitude. And that's what I'm trying to do with the articles on Substack as well. So I'm currently working on one on the Iliad just to help more people pick up the book and enjoy it. I think that's fundamentally what all teaching is about. It's helping you to see what is true, beautiful, good about these masterpieces so that you can appreciate them and have your life enriched by them. And you're still doing, you're doing private tutoring now, right? Yeah, that's right. So I teach one-on-one uh, -on -one most of the time, sometimes small groups, but that's how I provide for my family. And then the, the Substack and YouTube, general social media is just to network with people like you and try and reach some more people with some ideas as well. Mm -hmm. And and you have a, a rather large family also. Yeah, yeah. So my seventh child is coming in a few months. And uh, yeah, that's, a, again, a, a part of uh, seeing that life is good and then procreation is good as well. Big families are important. And that's how I find my fulfillment as a man. That's what we're ultimately made for. And it must have been, it must have been quite a thing for your family to go through you getting sacked from Eaton and having to watch you sort of fall and recover as a man and find a new way. That's right. Yeah. But ultimately you've got the choice, haven't you? You can either, <laughs> you can either imagine there's going to be a, a happy ever after and just work somewhere where you are compromising your integrity and contributing to the downfall of an important institution and also failing to stand up to ideas that in the future are going to come for your children. Or you can just stick to your principles, 
do what you think is right and accept that whatever happens in your life afterwards is going to be based on the truth. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. Well, I mean, so you offer tutoring for students in the UK, presumably to the UK system. Do you offer services to, to, I mean, I know you have the Substack as well. Do you offer services to men around the world? Because I see, I see some of the things you're talking about, I think are the same reasons that, that explain Jordan Peterson's appeal that, that he fights or fought so nobly in the marketplace of ideas with these giant, um, with these giant concepts, this giant understanding of the world that had been taken from us. And so many men found it so empowering to see a man fighting in that way. Um, and, and so I think that's some of the things that I think explain your appeal in, in a similar way. And so what, do, you, do you make offerings to men who, who, for example, don't need private tutoring for UK exams or UK education? A lot of the students that I help uh, from abroad, so maybe oh, China wow. or, or Russia, um, my lecture that I got fired from Eton for was actually translated for Chinese state media and they put it out to the country because they thought it had a really good message about masculinity. Oh, wow. So that was kind of weird for me to see that they valued what I got fired for so much they wanted to translate it and distribute it to everyone. That was a really weird disconnect. So I, I lost my house, my career for that. And yet over there, they're thinking this is really important and worthwhile. That took me a while to fully process. So apart from students who are just wanting to enjoy books or get better for exams, the Substack is mainly for people who felt that they haven't really had um, an education in these kind of topics from their normal wow. schooling. So there'll be normally one article a week covering various topics, sometimes book reviews, sometimes podcasts too. And then guys who will just want to talk about their identity as men or problems they've been through, they're welcome to, uh, to call in and then have a discussion and if they're happy that can go out on youtube to help other people as well that's the nolan knows talks to bros series and there's a few of them on my channel at the moment and nolan knows came from your students right your, stu your students gave you yeah, that. yeah 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 <laughs> that's great well where would you like to send men to find out the service you offer the writing that you do um, and find out more about you so you can catch me on youtube nolan knows k-n-o-w-l-a-n-d and then on Substack as well and those are the best places at the moment. If you want to just follow some of the ideas that I just put out, like idea sonar to see what people are interested in, then you can get me on Twitter too or Instagram. Excellent. Well, thank you, Will. I really appreciate the time. And this has been a fantastic conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's great to talk to you. Thanks for having me on.